Hi, everyone. Welcome uh, and thanks for joining us for uh, Targets, Talents and Tools in the Middle East. Um, we'll be uh, we'll be talking about offensive and defensive capabilities in the Middle East uh, with a special attention to sort of the state of critical infrastructure. Uh, my name is Aaron Ock. Um, I'm an associate at Good Harbor Security Risk Management. Um, my uh, my colleagues here, Chris Kubeka and Adrian Snabria, are uh, um, both both have quite the reputations as uh, security researchers and advisors. Um, I will uh, let the two of them introduce themselves. Uh, Chris, why don't we go to you? Hello, everyone. Um, I, I, I came into this field because I get bored easily and I like to hack everything. Um, so uh, I just have a passion for technology and love to share that knowledge. Yeah, and I'm Adrian Sanabria. I've been on uh, both the offensive and de defensive side of things. Um, done everything from, you know, as boring as a PCI QSA to as exciting as uh, some full red teams uh, in the Middle East. And um, currently, I am doing uh, product reviews of cybersecurity products. So I'm working to provide that as a service for the for the industry right now. But I still do a lot of research and really looking forward to this project that we're working on. Awesome. So I thought we'd start at the top uh, with you know a brief walkthrough of what we'll cover today. Um, so I wanted to start with um, you know a little bit of a discussion of uh, an inflection point that came in 2017 with the attack on the Petro Rabich plant in Saudi Arabia. Um, that for it goes by many names, but uh, that used the Trisys malware uh, to target uh, safety instrumented systems. Um, and then we'll we'll talk about the sort of regional challenges. Uh, you know, what what about the Middle East makes it such a, um, a hotbed for um, all of the cyber activity that we wind up seeing in it, um, and, and sort of the global implications of that. Um, we'll also talk about the sort of actor ecosystem and emerging technologies, particularly with respect to um, IIoT, industrial Internet of Things, um, as you know, as well as some of the uh, trends in OT management and and ICS. Um, uh, then we'll we'll talk about opportunity, or I'm sorry, you know, early intervention. Um, what some of the research that Adrian has has done most recently is on uh, attack surface management, um, and and I'm certainly looking forward to hearing him giving the most voiceover on that. Um, and then we'll we'll sort of conclude with uh, national capacities. Um, uh, norm building and and some further uh, you know questions that we have as we continue our research um, and uh, any potential questions that the audience has. Um, Chris, can we go to the next slide? Awesome, thank you so much. All right, so um, as I said, you know a major turning point came in in 2017. Uh, um, when you know, I think for the first time we really saw the weaponization, literal weaponization of critical infrastructure, um, or at least the potential for it, um, when attackers sought to disable the Triconnect safety instrumented system. Uh, safety instrumented systems are a subset of industrial control systems uh, at the Petra Rabih refinery in Saudi Arabia. Um, so while operations came to a standstill, uh, if it hadn't as they might in in another uh, attack on industrial control systems, um, if it hadn't been for a minor flaw in the malware's code, that attack would almost have assuredly led to the loss of life, uh, which is absolutely a sea change. Uh, we we hadn't really uh, we hadn't really seen attacks that that were meant to cause physical harm. Um, even in, in probably the most off-sited Stuxnet, uh, the most off-sited attack in the region, um, you know that that was a very that was meant to disable operations uh, and and not incur any sort of physical harm. Um, so you know, it, we know that attacks, especially on the oil and gas sector in the Middle East, don't start or finish here. Uh, the uh, the Middle East energy sector has repeatedly been targeted with cyber attacks over the last decade. Um, a, an 
um, sorry, a, a 2019 report from um, IBM actually put uh, estimated that about 50% of um, all of the cyber attacks in the Middle East uh, were were leveled at the at the oil and gas sector. Um, so while some of these attacks, including ransomware and wiperware campaigns, you know, have caused operational disruption. Uh, the attack vector is most often IT systems rather than OT systems themselves. Um, so usually not attacks aimed directly at industrial control systems. Uh, the Trisis attack, uh, like I said, marks, marks the shift for a couple of reasons. So as I, as I said, the weaponization of critical infrastructure. Um, and then secondly, uh, safety systems were previously thought to require physical presence to access but but in this case we're remotely altered uh which is which is interesting so you know as we as we see iiot uh bring systems we might previously have thought to have been air gapped online uh this certainly stands to become more of a danger um and then third you know the fact that this attack came so close to fulfilling its aim suggests that uh the attackers had a deep knowledge of industrial and uh, industrial environments and system specific protocols, um, the complexity of which were previously thought to, to make the work factor too significant for uh, direct, attack, direct attacks on, on industrial control systems, a sort of, um, I, I think ICS, uh, I, industrial control systems had previously been sort of insulated uh, or, or you know, it, there was sort of a security by obscurity about them. It required such deep knowledge. Um, and now uh, actors are are becoming um, either better versed in those protocols and, and the sort of uh, the communication flows between those systems um, or, you know, that uh, that that knowledge is just somehow uh, more widely distributed. Um, so if we could go to the next slide, that would be great. So the Middle East has the highest likelihood of a, of a catastrophic cyber attack, uh, like the one that I sort of just described um, coming close to. Uh, that's That was probably the, the biggest near miss we've seen. Um, but so the Middle East has, has the highest likelihood of this kind of catastrophic cyber attack. Um, and deadly malware targeting safety systems has not uh, really appeared anywhere else. Why? Um, we're still we're still not quite sure. We're looking forward to flushing that out a little bit more in our in our research to come. Um, but but just that statement uh, doesn't go so far as to explain what about the the cyber domain and what about the regional dynamics make it such a hotbed for activity. You know the concentration of oil reserves and the you know accordingly high volume of assets and and their complex supply chains uh, create a sort of formidable resource sprawl that you know attackers love because it it allows them to dwell places uh, to dwell in places um, and on assets that those assets owners and operators don't even know exist. Um, so, you know, the incentive for targeting these assets increases further when considering the, the financial and political economies of the region. Uh, national governments often own control and support firms in major industries like telecom, transportation, and energy production. Uh, and the national, or, or rather the roles that governments play in uh, the operation of that critical infrastructure inherently politicizes these physical assets, uh, making them choice, you know, targets for adversaries uh, to further their political, economic, and, and otherwise strategic aims. Um, beyond the region, you know, actors, namely Russia, China, and the U.S., have significant economic and strategic interests uh, in the region as well. So, um, it, they often find themselves hedging against one another in the region uh, and, and not just sort of entangled with, uh, not just sort of um, in finding adversaries in, you know, countries in the region. Um, so there's, there's, a, there's obviously a complex geopolitical dynamic at play here. And so, you know, the, the, 
these these powers alliances with countries in the region as well as their competition with one another you know has already incentivized offensive uh, plenty of offensive cyber action uh, against critical civilian infrastructure uh, which you know we think will remain if not uh, if not intensify um, unless deterrence wind up emerging um, so we've talked a little bit about the industrial asset rich richness uh, of the region making it a useful test bed um, you know the it it also provides it is a test bed in that um, attackers can can uh, aim attacks at, for example, the Triconex uh, safety instrumented system, um, and then use information from that attack to to turn around to other you know uh, other geographic or operational contexts of interest um, that that same system is used in, uh, and and level attacks there as well you know that 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 just that system is used uh, at the time of the attacks uh was used in at 18,000 industrial sites across the globe which is uh, obviously substantial um and and so we've seen these it, it, the uh the potential ramifications for attackers having that knowledge um and also knowing where their failures came in the petro rabich attack uh, winds up amplifying the potential consequences significantly uh, and taking them well beyond the region's borders. Um, so it, industrial control systems have, as I said, been less susceptible historically to widespread attacks because of those highly specific system configurations and protocols. Um, with you know, with the proliferation of sensors and other you know smart connected devices um uh coming online uh and bringing uh bringing legacy systems online with them um it becomes so much harder to air gap technologies uh and and you know sort of have them be micro segmented by default in a way that we might previously have considered um in many organizations there are very limited vetting processes to understand the security risks that are associated with uh, new technologies being acquired and deployed, uh, which you know, if we if we go from the national scale down to the sort of uh, firm and organizational scale, uh, this this increases the risk of an attack affecting uh, both both the new technology and other technologies on the on the same network, and and that governance piece becomes uh, becomes a, a, a sort of a, um, very much a very much a path uh, for for attackers. Um, the uh, I think another, as I said, I'll I'll mention the ecosystem briefly. Uh, another challenge is is the fact that there are uh, there are original equipment manufacturers, um, uh, systems integrators, and and other security firms, not to mention. Uh, the sort of uh, infirm owners and operators of these systems um, that that make the the responsibility for security uh, very opaque. Um, you know, the the OT environment was always considered sort of a, a black box uh, built by OEMs and and operated by by ICS companies. Uh, you know, who who themselves mandated that they be um, involved in change management processes, you know, unless that it, if if they weren't, then it would be a breach of contract. And so, um, you know, that they typically owned uh, by default, they sort of owned the security component of the systems, um, but largely have not uh, ha have been sort of neglecting um their due diligence in in keeping up with the other changes in, that are occurring in these ot environments um and and sort of lastly on this point a, attackers targeting uh scada and and ics directly would need to have a far more sophisticated uh understanding of of ot and um it, I, IoT devices and protocols in that environment than they they would say for launching an enterprise attack. Uh, I'm sorry, an enterprise IT attack. Um, 
that said, the knowledge required to uh, to conduct reconnaissance and, and stage exploitative operations in these environments uh, has proliferated. Um, even even if those uh, even if those operations have remained largely state sponsored, um, it you know with this proliferation comes a, a knowledge um, and a, a, a with this uh, I'm sorry with this proliferation comes a sort of uh, it comes a uh, we need talent uh, we need you know firms need um, attackers would need talent in order to support this, uh, in order to support these operations happening. And, and there is a market to support, uh, there is a market to support, um, you know, the, there is a market very much at the, at the hands of state to support, uh, those actors operating. Um, so the, the, the frequency, uh, of exploitation as that knowledge proliferates, uh, winds up increasing across both uh, critical infrastructure sectors and geographies. Um, and we may see the, the severity and type of threat uh, uh, change and increase. Mm -hmm. uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Chris. Mm -hmm. So some of the countries that we are looking at right now for our reports, they are listed here. And by the way, we will have a PDF of the slides available for everyone to view later. Now, what it currently looks with critical infrastructure is, well, some countries are doing great, some countries are not doing very well at all. And that also shows the differences within the region. Some countries have mature certs, some countries have certs pretty much by name only. And so you have to look at this from that perspective. There's a lot of crisis going on in the region. There's war going on in the region. And uh, it, it's very hard to uh, expect the entire region to uh, be, uh, I don't know, rather risk-free. Now, when I merge the data from a particular uh, tool across the entire region using those countries, and I focused in on critical infrastructure and especially uh, remoting that also had critical infrastructure that was attached to it, because we've seen that more and more come online with the pandemic, unfortunately. About 24% uh, of the data collected so far, we found that it looked to be vulnerable. Uh, of course, just looking vulnerable does not mean it can be exploited, but we could find certain vulnerabilities. And one of the scary things is, uh, when you expose critical infrastructure to the point where I can pull up a web interface of a Siemens system and can press buttons because there's no login, uh, those particular systems can be uh, all sorts of uh, fun and wonderful things for attackers, bad for civil society and uh, keeping the power on, for example. Um, as we see a lot of mass digitization and also technology flourish throughout the region as a whole, and trying to meet certain green goals and so forth, unfortunately, things like solar panels, wind turbines, et cetera, are also connected uh, to the internet, whether they meant to be or not. And uh, I've seen a lot of solar panels and green energy connected directly to the internet. Another one is Modbus. Now, if you're not familiar with Modbus, don't ever connect it to the internet. And I'll explain further in another slide. And Aaron had brought up Stuxnet. There are two particular countries that have way too much exposure of Siemens S7 uh, protocol, which actually was used back in the day for Stuxnet. But what happens is when you purchase these uh, pieces of equipment, you expect them to last a long time. And if you don't purchase the support contract and keep that going all the time for all the years that you are running that equipment, that means that sometimes these systems do not get updates and then we find vulnerabilities and exploits. So don't connect S7 and a lot of the other critical infrastructure and industrial IoT protocols to the internet. So S7, lots and lots of them. Modbus, uh, probably my favorite uh, protocol in critical infrastructure, uh, because it will take a command from anywhere 
without any authentication. Of course, it's not uh, directly, say, like an IT system. You have to issue it a certain set of commands in its format of hexadecimal, but still we are seeing more and more sophisticated attacks with full knowledge nowadays of the ICS protocols. I was also able to find uh, certain types of building control systems. You can buy these uh, stations, which are usually like security stations, for example, and they will be in police stations and hospitals. So I was able to find those. Uh, again, don't hook your police station or your hospital directly online. Loads of IoT, lots of industrial IoT. This also matches in with a lot of the mass digitization in the region. Another thing to consider is many countries in the region have better broadband or 5G, 4G access to connect to the internet than countries like the United States because they were able to leapfrog, which means they love to connect things. It's able to find data centers galore. And one of the vision statements for 2030 from UAE was to increase different types of data centers in their particular country. That wasn't the only place that I found things. Some very old encryption. Um, I love the name of Poodle Attack. Um, a, just a lot of outdated semen systems. And DNS open resolvers, especially on critical infrastructure, can go two ways. Somebody can get that, they can use that to actually be an attack tool because you should not have DNS open resolvers, especially on your critical infrastructure. And depending on uh, the geopolitics involved or the regime involved, some countries do pretty well with encryption, some mm, not so good with encryption. So there's logins that can be sniffed, all sorts of things, and there's barely any uh, HTTPS on anything involved. Now, because we didn't want to give away the particular countries uh, as of yet uh, when it came to the Middle East region, one of the things we did want to show you was some data that was collected a bit earlier. And what we're looking at with this particular graph is just to show you it's not just the Middle East, it's everywhere, um, but also you know what the importance is. And uh, in this graph, it's the 10 most connected countries and vulnerable assets as a uh, percentage of total online. Now, the US, it happens to have the most assets, almost 48 million you can see online. And out of that, we found about 26% uh, of those assets online were actually remotable and uh, had vulnerabilities included with them. China, well, they're the big winner, and that's also due to a little bit of their uh, regime, their government, which uh, like to uh, put themselves into any encryption certificates and be able to see as much as possible. Unfortunately, that kind of bit them in the behind because 59% of the total number of assets that I was able to find online had remote vulnerabilities that uh, we could find. The United Kingdom is doing very well, and I get a lot of questions about this as to why. Several years ago, uh, the UK uh, mandated that any company or organization, even an NGO, had to do what's called cyber essentials. And they gave them basically a checklist of about less than 10 items that they had to do. This was to get a lot of low hanging fruit. And because they've had that around for about six or seven years now, it's actually made a difference. So I highly recommend something like that in the region and even in the United States. So we have to be careful connecting things. And I will give it over to Aaron to explain this one. Yeah, I, I think that's a super helpful uh, global overview, um, you know, getting a sense of, of, you know, what countries are most vulnerable and then, you know, interpreting why that might be, um, you know, in that there might have been, given the fact that this is a, you know, our, our focus is the Middle East, there might have been a little bit of a question of, you know, well, where, where does uh, the Middle East fit into that, to that global top 10? It, it, it doesn't. But uh, for some of the other reasons, uh, for some of the other reasons I described earlier, um, it, it it is it is a, a very attractive um, it holds a very attractive set of targets for um, especially for geopolitical reasons. Uh, and so so one of the things we tried to do was uh, it was look at um, you know within countries in the Middle East who is most at risk. 
uh, or who has been most at risk historically, um, who is most active on the offense, um, how, how does that activity align with stated intent uh, by each of these states? Um, and so the, the list here is of, it, it's sorted according to that third column you see, the number of attacks suffered or uh, the number of attacks to which these, these countries have fallen victim. Um, Saudi Arabia being at the top of the list. And so while, so while this is the top eight, uh, you know, there are obviously many more countries in the region than this, but, but for our discussion of, of who is most active or um, where, where other, uh, where attacks are most active, this is it. Um, so, you know, very, uh, Saudi Arabia obviously being a very heavy target here, uh, like I said, particularly uh, because of the richness of its of its OT assets, perhaps, um, and then moving down the list, you know, there uh, it's obviously a decreasing number of attacks. But one thing I will point out uh, that is very interesting is that um, the number of attacks that each of these states has sponsored is is always uh, less than uh, usually a fraction of the number of attacks they've su they've suffered, with the exception of. Iran, uh, which almost doubles, uh, which almost doubles the number of attacks it has fallen victim to, uh, with the, I'm sorry, the number of attacks it has sponsored is almost doubled that of the attacks to which it's fallen victim, uh, which is, uh, which is, I, I think, on par with how uh, a lot of people hear about Iran in the media with respect to its sort of cyber offensiveness. Uh, and so this is an important thing for us to bear in mind. Um, it, not just that uh, not just that that cyber offensiveness is is anecdotal, but that that sort of bears out in the empirical evidence as well. Um, so some of the other columns we see here are uh, to to the left of the uh, of the victim and sponsored attacks are are sort of rankings according to. Um, according to cyber power indices, uh, on the far left is the is the global cybersecurity index, uh, which comes from the International Telecommunications Union. Um, a drawback of this is that it does rely on self-reported data um, from from each of these countries. And then to the right of that um, is the National Cyber Power Index, which comes from uh, Harvard University's Belfer Center. Uh, and while only some of the countries listed here, that lists the, the 29 most cyber capable countries in the world. And so while um, only some of those, uh, some of the countries on this list make uh, make the National Cyber Power Index, it's still, uh, it's, it's instructive to see sort of where they fall and how they rank among one another with, with um, Egypt among this, among this set. Uh, among the set that made the National Cyber Power Index being uh, the least powerful and Israel being the most powerful. Um, and, you know, they're, they're with any, um, as, as we consider these indices for our own research, you know, it's important to, uh, it's important to recognize the limitations, especially with respect to uh, the sort of, uh, the, the, strategically classified nature of of cap technical capabilities as well as the sort of human resources that are that are making that possible um, so uh, you know the I, I think uh, this is just a, a sort of flavor of um, you know how we are how we are approaching uh, some of the research yet to come with respect to assessing capabilities and, and really asking ourselves sort of what what is not present within some of these these uh, indices and and otherwise statistics uh, you know what what factors were not considered that we that we need to especially with respect to this sort of um, operations techn operational technology landscape um, anyway thanks for uh, thanks for giving me the mic Chris Adrian I'll let you take it away. Mm -hmm. Thanks everyone for, for, for that fantastic panel. If we have any questions, please put them in the uh, Q&A right now. Uh, we don't have another talk until uh, about 1.30, so 
by all means, you guys can, can stay online if, if people are, are having a... We, we did have some more slides. Oh yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I, heard, I heard the pause and I thought that you were done because it's one o'clock. Sorry. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, we, we, we were going to use some of that extra time, time, if you don't mind. Yeah, no, you, you, you have plenty of time. We don't have a, we do not have anything at one o'clock. So. All right. How about it? Thank you. Love that. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, a lot of what uh, Aaron and Chris have have talked about so far um, is is a great primer in coming to this new market that we're seeing of attack surface management tools. And just to share a quick anecdote, I, I do a lot of mentoring, and one of the exercises I go through with my mentees is I, I teach them how to find critical infrastructure uh, on, on the internet. You know, just to show them how easy it is to make these mistakes and how easy it is to find a lot of this stuff. Uh, what Chris called low-hanging fruit. And, um, you know, the, the last time I did it, you know, it, it could be anything that we go after, but, you know, we did a Google search for uh, companies that make brewing equipment, like like uh, large-scale brewery equipment. And um, that takes a couple seconds to find a few names of companies that make this equipment. Then we pop over to Shodan. If you're familiar with Shodan, it's basically a searchable index of infrastructure on the internet, connected to the internet. And we pop in the name of that uh, equipment provider and you, you get a list of uh, you know, where Shodan scanning the entire internet has found instances of this equipment connected to the internet. And more often than not, uh, the first, maybe the second, rarely the third, um, has no authentication. You're able to get in there, you, know, you, could, you could potentially spoil you know, a, a 50,000 gallon batch of beer, you know, or something like that. And, um, and and that's really where these attack surface management tools come in. They're designed to find that low hanging fruit. Um, you know, a lot of these vulnerabilities in, in, in the bar chart uh, earlier, um, they're designed to find that stuff for you and expose it, uh, you know, make you aware of it uh, so that you can you can then do something about it. And they generally run in different levels of uh, uh, sophistication where I mentioned Shodan, you know, that's kind of the simplest form of it here is you, you've got these organizations like Shodan, Census, um, you know, there, there's a Chinese based one that I'm blanking on the name of, uh, that have basically scanned the entire internet and for free or for a small fee, you can query their databases of everything that they found. Uh, when, when they've run these scans. Um, when you take it up to a higher level of, of uh, sophistication, some of these allow you to input the assets that you own and they'll monitor them for you. And then some of them will go out and do what I call seed discovery. And based on just the name of your company or a few domain names, uh, they'll attempt to find the rest of the IP space that you own or other domain names that you own that maybe you weren't even aware of. Uh, we see a lot of cases, especially my time as a pen tester, I'm sure Chris has seen this, where you find entire IP ranges, domains, assets that uh, the current people at the company didn't realize existed because uh, whoever set that stuff up left and it's basically been abandoned. So the software, the systems running uh, on, on those resources uh, you know, because they're out of sight, out of mind, uh, they're basically abandoned. Eventually that software uh, will age, people will find vulnerabilities, and since nobody's aware of them, nobody's updating that software. And, and uh, they're effectively just waiting for someone good or bad to discover them and either notify the organization that they're out there. You know, we've got our good Samaritans out there that, that will do that. Or, you know, the other choice, the other path. Where, where somebody uh, does something not so good with them. And, um, and then at the top level of sophistication here, uh, we have uh, tools and companies trying to um, determine the level of risk of these, you know, because you can find, especially with a large organization, uh, these tools will find a lot of stuff. So you really do need to prioritize them. Um, you know, so obviously, critical infrastructure with no authentication, if you've got Modbus connected to the internet, uh, it's gonna show up at the top of that list. Uh, and, and then it's gonna work its way down to maybe, you know, uh, you know, SSL, TLS vulnerabilities, things like that, that are 
a bit more complex to take advantage of. Uh, so really, that's the that's the purpose of these tools. And um, generally, when we think about these public exposures, we think in terms of devices with IP addresses, resources with IP addresses attached to them that that can be scanned. Uh, but really, these tools go uh, far beyond that. You know, they'll some of them will look for data leaks, uh, and, and right now it's an early market, so they don't all look for the same things. Um, some of them will will scan, uh, you know, GitHub repositories looking for maybe leaked credentials, you know, that that somebody shared uh, publicly on there, or you know, it could be uh, an open S3 bucket. You know, no no IP based scanner is going to find open S3 buckets, uh, you know, related to your company. And with that point you know, some of the, even some of the IP based stuff may not exist in the same country as the organization. You know, there's no reason that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure most, a lot of Middle East uh, organizations have stuff running in AWS in regions that are not physically located in the Middle East. So the idea that you can just scan based on the geographical location of the IP addresses to find everything, you know, is, is in itself kind of faulty. You'll find stuff uh, in the U.S., maybe in Germany, um, maybe where branch offices are located, uh, you know, that that could have sensitive stuff belonging to this organization, uh, in, including critical infrastructure. So if we pop to the next slide there. So, and these are just a few examples here. Um, you know, so the, the uh, abandoned infrastructure is a common one. You know, as a pen tester and red teamer, you know, I'd often find these. Uh, you know, I mentioned the the misconfigured uh, S3 bucket. You know, it's it's very easy place to put uh, log files, to put data. You know, we've seen startups uh, competing with Uber and things like that, where you know, an open S3 bucket has copies of people's passports, driver's license, you know, the identification they need to get onboarded. Um, you know, all kinds of stuff like that. Anything from uh, internal manuals, you know, that could have interesting information uh, in them to, you know, lots and lots of PDFs and paperwork, you know, with with uh, banking details, with, uh, um, you know, pretty much uh, S3 buckets can be used like uh, Windows file shares and things like that. They become dumping grounds uh, for data, you know, that that aren't closely monitored. And then, you know, the final example here, one of the use cases we've seen with these attack surface management tools is, I, I mentioned seed discovery earlier, and what that means is, um, you know, it, it'll find top level uh, assets that you own, you know, that you maybe haven't thought to input. You know, so I input company A, you know, maybe this tool comes back and says, hey, company A also has seven subsidiaries. You know, and then maybe a month later, that parent company acquires a new company. Some of these tools will actually scan things like Crunchbase. Um, you know, in, in the U.S., we, you know, things like SEC filings will mention acquisitions. And these tools are smart enough to say, hey, you acquired a new company. Here's all their attackable resources. Here's all their vulnerable resources that you should be aware of, uh, which is a really neat idea because, the again, the problem they're trying to solve here is discovering things that can hurt you that you're not aware of, you know. And if the tool is based on you knowing what to enter, you know, then you've already failed. You know, it's it, you've got to have some element where it's actually going out and trying to find the things that you forgot, weren't aware of, uh, or you know, as as an ongoing management tool, um, you know, as as you acquire more companies, as infrastructure changes. Uh, you know, making sure you're aware of anything new. All right, next slide. And a lot of this sounds similar to external vulnerability scanning. You know, probably every organization out there does some level of vul external vulnerability scanning uh, today. But again, the issue there is most external vulnerability scanners are only going to scan what you tell them to. If you fail to tell them to scan everything that uh, you should be aware of or, or that you own, you know, then, then you know, you're going to be blind to the, to the issues with those, with those devices and resources. And um, the workflow, however, is very similar. You know, basically, you're going to scan these resources. Uh, you know, the findings are going to be analyzed. 
you know, risk ranking applied to them, prioritize, fix, rinse, and repeat. Um, but again, not all these resources have IP addresses attached to them. And most vulnerability management tools, you know, that's a base requirement is there's got to be an IP address uh, attached to it for it to be uh, an object that we would attach the findings to. You know, so your S3 buckets, um, you know, leaked data, things like that, uh, you know, your general vulnerability management tools are not going to find. So this is very complementary to, to your external vulnerability management program. And that's where I would recommend putting this tool. Whoever's managing your Qualys, your Nessus, your Rapid7 is also going to manage this tool or this function. All right. So yeah, timelines of the report. Um, yeah, we're, we're, as Chris mentioned, you know, we're working on this now. Uh, all three of us are, are working on this. We already have some preliminary data that we're working through. Um, I don't know, Chris, did, did you want to talk about this? You probably. Sure. Uh, so we, we are aiming to try to get the report out uh, at least by August, uh, hopefully no longer. Um, in addition to that, what we are doing is we're combining our efforts, the three of us, with also some external efforts, or excuse me, experts, and uh, looking at in each section to put in uh, case studies from real world examples, short case studies. Because although it's going to be a report, we're aiming to have it no longer than 25 pages, digestible. Talking about, firstly, the current state of critical infrastructure in the region, as well as the second report uh, looking at some of the uh, offensive digital capabilities and tools that are currently being used in the region. And uh, like I said, all of us like real world stuff because we can relate to real world stuff instead of just FUD. Do you want me to keep talking, Adrian? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I think you, right, you, so, you know all this better than I do. All right, so uh, one of the things that the Middle East Institute has been working on is a cyber addendum to the current Abraham Peace Accord, uh, listing three main factors. If one country comes under attack, uh, have mutual uh, assistance. Another one is don't attack each other's critical infrastructure. And another one is uh, limited to no use of various surveillance tools against uh, another country. And we included with Richard Clark a um, note to also add a red phone, the old fashioned red phones that were used in the Cold War so in case a particular country uh, thinks that some other country within the uh, court is being rather naughty uh, before bad, bad things happen. Uh, they can just call up that line at any moment. Another thing to look at is, this is something I presented to the United Nations last year, was looking at an external computer emergency prevention team. Currently, even if you have the most mature of certs, uh, they're typically not a huge team. They wear many hats. They've got to post vulnerability information, take vulnerability disclosures, train uh, and offer constituent services, and they generally do not have the time to proactively look at critical infrastructure. And uh, this can be very problematic. Now, in addition to that, uh, a point that uh, Adrian had brought up was we can't just be proactive looking at this. We also have to look at proactive defense because that will also uh, cut down on the dwell time uh, that can occur between when we actually find that something's gone wrong and how long they've been there. And uh, we need to proactively look at this. Another issue with the region is not everyone wants to share data with the government, which is understandable. But hopefully we can work towards at least some of the regional governments where there is much more trust uh, with the government and or regimes that uh, they would be willing to have that public private data sharing agreement at least on the CERT level and contact the CERT level, and hopefully that CERT is mature enough to handle a crisis. Purple teaming is always a good idea, that mix of defense, offense, uh, testing yourselves, uh, also with simulation training, and uh, I, I liken it to when I was an air crew member in the Air Force, uh, nobody was gonna put us directly into a plane. 
thank goodness, and have us fly it, uh, we had to go through a simulator. And we had to, during those time frames, uh, go through different types of crisis. And if you can't do well in the simulation, you're not going to do well in real life, but you need to practice, practice, practice. And some of the lessons from the IT world can also be used in the OT world. What I mean by that is um, looking at how the reaction is, looking at how an incident is handled, including all the rest of your staff. And there's also more proliferation of IT in OT environments as we move forward. Absolutely. And so, I mean, this slide uh, is is mostly to sort of bolster, um, you know, some of the some of what Chris just talked about on the on the last slide. Uh, but but rather frame it, um, frame some of those takeaways uh, as questions for our further research, um, and and really put these things to the test as we um, as we you know do both expert interviews as well as uh, more sort of technical probing. Uh, with some really helpful uh, technology partners that have uh, that have that are helping us out with this project, um, I think I you know without going through each of them uh, too specifically, I think a, a major question uh, for for us in in just thinking about some of those takeaways, right? You know, purple teams and and certs and seps and um, is is where you know that we know that the technology exists uh, we, and we know that the vulnerabilities exist um, where do the human resources come from necessarily and and to what uh, you know to what are, are they are they being funneled to the to the you know the light or the dark side uh, may the fourth be with you um, and and are they you know are, are they working on behalf of government you know even what for offense or defense, you know, are they working? Uh, are they working for the government? Are they working uh, in uh, for for private firms? What is the relationship between certs and seps and uh, the security teams at it, it, it private or quasi private for you know, it, it's a it gets to be a very difficult constellation to sort of parse apart uh, in the region because uh, because it, it's a different um, commercially it, it it's a different model than than what we follow in the United States so so it's examining some of those country by country uh, particularities and really aligning those with uh, really um, picking apart our own assumptions uh, and aligning our, our findings with sort of key risks in the region I think is is going to be a really exciting part of exploring these these questions uh, Chris or Adrian do you have anything to add? Yeah, I, I think your last point's a good one because you, you kind of have to do that. You know, that that's kind of the the bane of old school security is is um, saying just fix it. You know, like like here's yeah. a bunch of problems I found. Uh, good luck. Uh, you, you really do have to consider um, the constraints, the resources. You know, how things work in you know every organization, much less every country. You know, is different in how they operate. Uh, and OT is absolutely, you know, very, very different from IT. You know, so the when we start to think about um, remediating things, you know, we 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 definitely have to keep that in mind. You know, like like the ages of these systems. You know, how patching happens. You know, I often say patching is one of the most disruptive things you can do in an IT or OT environment. You know, yeah, maybe it fixes that security issue and then introduces three more bugs. <laughs> you know, so. It's it's uh, I think a lot of people with a, the kind of the security mindset that haven't worked on that side, you know, to them, it's it's simple. Just just patch it, you know, just just get that patch in there, you know. But uh, those of us that have worked on that side know it's not not quite that simple. <laughs>